Now, as promised, we have to talk about foreshortening. By means of foreshortening, the transducer is simply too much cranial. That is why we do not cut the LV apex, but the left ventricular walls. And by doing so, we can never see the true apical areas. And here is an example, which is nicely seen that the papillary muscle reaches almost the apex, which cannot be. So if you see the papillary muscles in the last third of the ventricle or reaching the apex of the left ventricle, there must be a problem. So mostly it's foreshortening, so you have to move one intercostal space down. The second thing you can depict here is that the left ventricular apex always moves inwards the left ventricular cavity. That is also a feature which is either pathological or simply you do foreshorten. Always when you see those features or overall I would say always try when you have an, a good view of the heart to move one intercostal space down just to be sure that you are truly seeing the apical regions. Also try breathing maneuvers. So if you see an image like this and then you go more apical and then you do not see the left ventricle optimally, let the patient inhale, let the patient exhale to see if the image quality might change. Very often it actually does and from my personal experience with inhaling, you often see the left ventricle even better. So keep in mind the optimal orientation, avoiding foreshortening is essential to perform good echocardiographic exams. Yes, foreshortening is bad, of course, here in this very severe example of foreshortening, we have really small left ventricular volumes, we overestimate ejection fraction, we do not see the apical region, so we do not see wall motion abnormalities, we do not see thrombi, and we do not see, for example, an apical hypertrophy or also hypertrabeculation. So keep in mind, foreshortening is truly bad. How to avoid it? Move one intercostal space down. As said earlier, just try one intercostal space downwards and overall more lateral, more downwards for the apical views. And if you have an optimal two-chamber view, you can see that foreshortening can be avoided in this case. So the true left ventricular apex normally, not in this case, in this case we have again the apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the apical regions, really the apex, it is very, very thin. You can see that in MR quite nicely when you truly depict the left ventricular apex. So keep in mind to optimize your image, the field of view, and in an optimized two-chamber view, you can avoid foreshortening. Why should we use then the apical four-chamber view? And the other question around is, why should we not? The apical four-chamber view is simply amazing. You can see the global left ventricular function. You can see right ventricular function. You see the chamber dimension. You see the chamber dimensions of the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the left atrium, the right atrium. You see the interventricular septum. You see the interatrial septum. You see almost all the valves you want to find. You see tumors. You see free fluids, so pericardial effusion, thrombi. So with the four chamber view, that is the view you want to go in cardiology from my personal standpoint. And here is an example of a severe tricuspid regurgitation after a triclip. So you see that every valve, every chamber, every structure, even clips can be visualized in echocardiography. Here's another example of a four chamber view. And there's a problem with the valve. You see the left ventricle seems borderline in size, almost a little bit dilated already. And you do see that the valve has a problem. There is severe mitral regurgitation. It might not look like this initially, but you see the hyperdynamic LV function. You see the eccentric jet. That is a patient where a flail leaflet was present. So severe MR with a flail leaflet using color Doppler and the apical four chamber view. There are some rare structures you also can visualize. And in this case, we found a pericardial cyst. So here's the right ventricle, the left ventricle, the right atrium and the left atrium here you can depict the left atrial appendage and this below the right atrium there's a structure it's there is no blood flow in it you can see that again with contrast with contrast imaging left atrium right atrium right ventricle and left ventricle and this black structure stays as it is seen here black so there's no blood flow present that turned out to be and it was proven by an MRI, a pericardial cyst. You can differentiate several diseases or at least get 
an idea which disease might be present. In this case, we have amyloid heart disease. Note the dilated left, the dilated right atrium. There is also atrial fibrillation present. See the valves, how they are closing prematurely, both the mitral and the tricuspid valve, the anterior and the posterior mitral valve leaflet. Here the anterior posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve and here the septal leaflet, the severely concentric thickened left ventricle. You do see here the corda tendine, the papillary muscles and a patient with already, even with this severely thickened LV, a reduced left ventricular function in amyloid heart disease. Or to be more specific, a left ventricular ejection fraction, which is reduced, of course, left ventricular function is in this case, probably severely reduced by means of strain imaging. This patient had a strain, a global longitudinal strain of around minus 10%. In this case, we have another example of a thickened heart. This is so-called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Note that right ventricular function, as there is no involvement, the right ventricle is not really hypertrophied, is normal. The atria are smaller compared to the patient with the amyloid heart disease. And it's simply a very different feature how the ventricle looks. There is no LVOT obstruction. We have here again the mitral valve leaflet. We do have a part, I would say, caudal SAM. So the SAM is the systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. In this case, we do see that the SAM occurs only for the corded tendon and because there's a little bit of acceleration in blood flow, of course, at the outflow tract. We do see this, especially at the septum hypertrophied ventricle with a high normal ejection fraction in the range of 60 to 65%. We do see also a hypermobile interatrial septum and the thickening in especially the septal regions is severe, but also the anterolateral wall is thickened. The papillary muscles are also hypertrophied. Two more examples. This is a patient with uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, so severely reduced ejection fraction with another pathology, a left bundle branch block. You see this rocking motion of the apex, you see this septal flash, so it's an ineffective contraction of the ventricle. You see the broad ECG, so a left bundle branch block seen in this example. And here we have a patient with a left atrial tumor, which turned out to be a myxoma. So with the for chamber view, you really, truly can differentiate many pathologies. 